Well, welcome to the second webinar series, uh, Uncover Webinar, Gender, Violence, Media and Arts. This webinar series aims to discuss the representations of gendered violence and sexual violence in various forms of contemporary media and arts. This webinar series is associated with two projects at SESH, the FCT project Uncover, Sexual Violence in Portuguese Mediascape, a three-year project with an interdisciplinary team coordinated by Sofia de Santos, and with my individual six-year project as SEC Fellow, Disentangling Rape, Sexual Violence in Portuguese Literature and Cinema in the 21st Century. Our webinar today is also associated with SESH Working Group, GPS, Research Group on Sexualities, which is coordinated with Ana Cristina Santos, who is also here with us, I saw her, and Mafalda Steves and myself. Uh, we would like to invite you to visit the website of our project Uncover, where you can get more information about our webinars, the publications and the activities of the project, and also about the media presence of some of the project researchers. Uh, at Canal SESH, you can access the podcast of the first Uncover webinar, Deep Fakes, Manipulation of Images and Sexual Content content it was put online today uh, this webinar was organized by Maria João Faustino and you can access the the podcast there uh, today's webinar um, the presentations only the presentations not the debate is being recorded as you have noticed and will also be put online uh, later as a podcast uh, now let me um, introduce and welcome our guests today, Dr. Angeliki Sifaki and Professor Paola Baceta. It is a great honor to have you here with us. Thank you so much, Angelika, for accepting our invitation to share the work that you are developing in the project Homo Classicismus. And thank you so much, Paola, for accepting Angeliki's invitation to discuss her work here with us. Today's webinar, Classical Antiquity and LGBTQ Movements, Adventures of in the Archives, will discuss the position of classical antiquity in contemporary lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans and queer historiographies. Now, let me just make a very brief presentation of our guests. You can access their CVs via the web page of our webinar and see their amazing publications and activities. Now, first, a few words about Angeliki. Angeliki Sifaki is Marie Curie Global Postdoctoral Fellow here at the Center for Social Studies. Her three, uh, new, this uh, three-year research project titled Homo Classicisms, Dangerous Liaison, Classical Antiquity and LGBTQ Movements in Greece, the UK and the US, is a cooperation between SESH and the Department of Classics, Ohio State University. Previously, she developed a research project entitled, titled Homo Politics, Greek Homo Nationalism, Entanglement of Sexual Politics with Issues of Race and Nationalism in the Case of Lesbian and Gay Movements and Queer Activist Groups in Greece. It was also funded by the European Commission uh, under the um, Marie Curie Action Scheme. She has a PhD from the Utrecht University with re a research project, Greek Lesbian Teachers, School, Nation, Family. Uh, in 2020, she was elected as the chair of Ad Gender, a role which she served until September last year. And among her publications is the edited volume on nationalism, femonationalism, and ego nationalism. Now, a few words about Paola. Paola Bacchetta is Professor and Vice Chair for Research in the Department of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of California, Berkeley. She is also Director of the Institute for Gender and Sexuality Research. She currently serves as Co-Coordinator of, co of Decolonizing Sexualities Network, a transnational convergence of scholars, activists and artivists. Her books, her books include, among, among others, Co-motion on feminist and queer solidarities forthcoming in Duke University Press, Fatima Menisis for Our Times, co-edited with Mino Moalem, 
global raciality, empire, post-colonial, post-coloniality, and decoloniality, co-edited with Sunaina Myra and Howard Wynand, and right-wing women, co-edited with Margaret Power. She has published over 70 articles and, cha- and book chapters, and she has translated to multiple texts, including Fatima Menisi's film project, The Lioness. She is the recipient of multiple awards, Harvard Divinity School, Fulbright, and many more. So thank you so much for accepting our invitation. Angelica, now the floor is yours, please. Hello, thank you everyone for being here. I'm happy to see you. I know most of you. So I'm happy to to hear to hear you to to have you here with me today. Uh, first of all, thank you Julia for this generous introduction and for your kind invitation to present my work in the context of the project at cover Sexual Violence in Portuguese Mediascape the first ever transdisciplinary study about sexual violence in Portuguese media. I feel truly honored to have received such an invitation by you. Also, dearest Professor Paura Baqueta, I would like to thank you with all my heart for having accepted to be the discussant of this paper today. It's such a great honor to receive your feedback and invaluable insights And I do hope we can continue our dialogue and intellectual exchanges for months to come in case the project speaks to your interest. Last, on a beautiful day like this, I can imagine that there are so many wonderful activities that a person could undertake. You have chosen, though, to be here with us. I cannot but thank you for this, and I want to believe that you have taken the right decision. As Julia has already mentioned, my name is Agilki Sifaki, and I am a global postdoctoral Marie Curie fellow. Currently, I am running a three-year project which is titled Dangerous Liaison, Classical Antiquity and LGBT Movements in Greece, the UK and the US. The project is a cooperation between the Center for Social Studies, SES, at the University of Coimbra, in Portugal and the Department of Classic at Ohio State University in the US. So uh, the project started in October 2023 and it was only in December when I moved to London to start my field work, which is basically archival research. Currently, I have just carried out my field work in Los Angeles and before that in London, while for the next couple of months, I will be in New York City. Therefore, today, I'm not going to discuss a finished work, but a work in progress. I'm well aware that among us, there are scholars who are much more advanced than me. Any observations, remarks, and productive critiques are more than welcome. Specifically, I would like to ask your opinion about the following. Today, under the current circumstances and the sharp rise of far-right parties and movements in most Western countries, is a critique against mainstream LGBTQ politics still relevant? And if so, what should be the terms of that critique in order not to be co-opted by the extreme right parties? Following the previous question, what kind of theoretical approach would you adopt for such a project? Which academic disciplines are relevant? Last, a more technical question. Having collected already around 5,000 pictures, How would you analyze this archival material? I cannot stress enough that I consider myself extremely lucky to have this opportunity to receive feedback during the presentation. In case there are points which are unclear or abstract, please feel free to raise your hand and interrupt interrupt me. I am totally fine with that. As already announced in this webinar, I will discuss the position of classical antiquity in contemporary lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans, and queer historiographies. Acknowledging historiography as a political practice, this presentation seeks to examine how dominant western centering form of historiography reinforce power dynamics that oppress and marginalize specific shares of LGBTQ populations, for instance, queers of color, in order to counteract the violence that erases, silences, and imposes specific forms of knowing history. 
To this aim, the structure of the presentation I propose for today is the following. First, I will speak shortly about my previous project and how they have culminated in the current one. Then I will offer some observations about the position of classical antiquity in current discourses, images, symbols, and representation. Following this, I will discuss the project general framework and its political relevance. In the last part of the presentation, I will introduce the archives I have visited so far, and I will present some of the material I have gathered. And then we will open the floor for questions, remarks, and etc. So, first part. Uh, my first project had the title Greek Lesbian Teachers, School Nation Family. This research project, the first and still the only one to engage with the subjectivity of Greek lesbian teachers, provided an interview-based analysis of the life narratives of 17 lesbian women who work within the Greek educational system. Its main research question was, how do Greek lesbian teachers construct their subjectivities and negotiate their sexuality in relation to the social context in which they are situated? Stemming from this, uh, the sub-questions guiding the three chapters of the thesis were how do gender and sexuality intersect with the professional identity of Greek lesbian teachers? How does the subjectivity of Greek lesbian teachers relate to their constitution as national subjects? Uh, how do Greek lesbian teachers as daughters negotiate their sexuality within their family networks? What meaning do Greek lesbian teachers give to the coming out process? And what kinds of implications for the way they construct themselves as lesbians does this entail? During my studies abroad, Extensive reading of literature on LGBT issues and my frequent attendance at international meetings and conferences have allowed me to make two empirical observations. My first observation relates to knowledge production on Greece and Greeks. Here, I echo the argument of the anthropologist Michael Herzfeld that Greece to court is almost always automatically assumed to be ancient Greece, an idea supported by even the shortest Google Scholar sets. When the keywords Greece, homosexuality, and lesbianism are searched together, the first and most frequent results, uh, results refer to ancient Greece. Additionally, the fact that modern Greece is the most common descriptive term for Greece in a contemporary context implies that there is both a juxtaposition and a link with ancient Greece. My second observation is the frequency with which I am asked on the basis of my Greek nationality to verify an interpretation of Plato, for example, uh, with the exception of questions regarding the recent years of austerity in Greece, I am rarely asked about the country's more recent history. I have come gradually aware, not without surprise and discomfort, that the way I am portrayed as Greek makes me more expert on classical literature than on modern Greek history. The connection of modern day Greece with ancient Greece has not only been an empirical observation. While analyzing the interviews with Greek lesbian teachers, I observed that some of my interviewees tended to identify with the Greek nation drawing heavily on historical narratives. Uh, while simultaneously expressing Western-centric views on cultural hierarchies concerning the non-Western migrant communities living in Greece. Guided by this observation, my second project was titled Greek Homonationalism, Entanglement of Sexual Politics with Issues of Race and Nationalism in the case of lesbian and gay movements and queer activist groups in Greece. Its main research question was, what narratives, images, symbols, and representation do Greek lesbian and gay movements and queer activist groups utilize in order to assert their rights to citizenship 
and who is left out of the imagined us they construct. For the aims of this specific project, I gather archival material from 34 lesbian and gay movements and activist groups being active in Greece since the fall of dictatorship in 1974. On. Uh, there is something making noise. I think. Okay. Uh, when I say archival material, I mean poster, magazines, zines, pictures, interviews of prominent LGBTQ activists. What I immediately observe in the material is the many, and I mean many, references to ancient Greece. Let me give you a couple of examples. Here is the project. In 2013, on the occasion of the 9th Athens Pride, and while the number of newly arrived migrants and refugees in Europe was increasing, the slogan selected by the organizers read, Athena is ours. Written in capital letters, the stress could be put either on the second syllable, Athena, formulating the word Athens, the capital city of Greece, or on the third syllable, Athena, standing for the ancient, uh, both virgin and militant, goddess of Greek mythology. Framed by a shield, the slogan was printed on a bicolor poster for training two warrior-like women in their weaponry, facing each other and being ready to kiss on the lips. A few years later, in 2021, the Athens Pride comes back with a new poster, bringing again to mind the idea of ancient Greece. The slogan selected this time reads, What United Us, next to the picture of the Parthenon. To the above, I should add that since 2008, the logo of the Athens Pride, from a gender-neutral stick finger holding a rainbow flag, has changed into the Parthenon in rainbow colors. Having made the above observation, I started wondering about the following questions. What is the meaning of fencing Greek imaginary in the discourses, images, symbols, and representation of the LGBT communities in Greece? Who is left out of this imaginary? Is this imaginary relevant only for the Greek case? It was out of these questions that homoclassicism was born. Its recent question is what narratives, images, symbols, and representation from classical antiquity do contemporary LGBTQ movements in Greece, the UK, and the US utilize in their attempt to build and articulate particular past? Who is left out of the LGBTQ historiographies and representation of classical antiquity each of the three contexts builds upon? Stemming from this, the sub-questions are are the classic used differently in these three different sociopolitical and cultural contexts? Do discourses of homosexual desire in classical antiquity used by the LGBTQ movements intersect with those of empire and race? The project adopts a bottom-up approach which stems from within the LGBTQ movements themselves to investigate whether in their attempt to articulate that particular past, the movements might become complicit with racialized narratives of identity formation, segregating and disqualifying specific racial and ethnic others from LGBTQ historiography at a time when a large number of non-white LGBTQ population reside in Greece, the UK, and the US. Indeed, this is an urgent question that requires an intersectional and interdisciplinary lens to examine how dominant Western centering forms of historiography reinforce power dynamics that oppress and marginalize specific shares of LGBTQ populations, for instance, queers of color. So I now will proceed with the second part of this presentation. Classical, I have named that classical antiquity as white supremacy. While the legacy of classical antiquity was fading from public discussions in the previous century, 
there is currently a proliferation of international discourses, images, symbols, and representation that throw on the classical era, the latter, uh, the later educated with the Greco-Roman world. In political speeches, as the one that you see here, between uh, Donald Trump and uh, the president of a leftist uh, party in Greece, a blockbuster films, books. For instance, you will see that in this book by Boris Johnson, in the second edition, he has added a, a, a second title saying, with new material uh, on the rise of Islam, uh, music, and dating websites. For instance, this one, White Date, which talks a lot about the cultural heritage. International audiences have rediscovered the merits of classical antiquity as mass spectacle. By now, it has been well documented that agents from across the political spectrum and in many parts of the world mobilize the classical past to construct shared meanings, identities, and narratives. At the same time, such classical discourses, images, symbols, and representations have been appropriated by nationalist political parties. For instance, Golden Dawn in Greece, British National Party in the UK, and white supremacist and immigrant movements in the US, like Identity Europa, sparkling a new uh, interest among scholars of nationalism and colonialism. For instance, the platform Pharos doing justice to the classics. Research finding in various, in various fields have revealed that racialized readings of classical antiquity about these readings envision Western civilization as a white skin, European derived racial and cultural heritage anchored in the classical worlds of Greece and Rome. Following Martin Bernal's uh, work Black Athena, the Afro-Asiatic roots of classical civilization, many theorists have argued that the fabrication of ancient Greece as the national heritage of modern day Greece and as the cultural progenitor of European civilization is an ideological construction of history of a particular kind. Far from being a historically inevitable of politically innocent model, it has been deployed historically and in the present to support and reinforce the distinctiveness and superiority of Europeans and the Western world in general over other cultural groups. It has thus legitimated Western colonial practices, cultural hegemony, and civilizing mission. It is not a coincidence that the classes have long been associated with the former empires and the imperial glories of the 19th and early 20th centuries. The anthropologist Michael Herzfeld uses the term crypto-colonialism to describe the material, cultural, and historical entanglements between Greece and Europe. According to his definition, crypto-colonialism is the curious alchemy whereby certain countries, buffer zones, between the colonized lands and those as yet untamed were compelled to acquire their political independence at the expense of massive economic dependence, a relationship that was articulated in the iconic guise of aggressively national culture fashioned to suit foreign models. Specifically, with the demise of the Ottoman Empire and the advent of nationalism as a distinctive ontological apparatus of Western modernity, Greece's lack of internal national homogeny became an issue of the most urgent priority among competing groups. German, Americans, and British feelings of the time, in concert with Greek historians, carefully selected and reinterpreted those cultural myths, symbols, memories, and traditions of the past that could reproduce their own vision of a great civilization, 
not necessarily the ones that had persisted in everyday life. And that would force imaginary attachments of the modern Greek nation to ancient Greece, bringing about the impression of an unbroken and unproblematic continuity. This refashioning stood as the link that would integrate Byzantium into Greek historiography, a period connected ancient with modern Greek history, leading to the construction of Hellenochristian civilization. This European model for the formation of a modern Greek nation state provided the cornerstone for the aesthetic and ideological project that was meant to become the foundation of the West classical past. The artistic, dramatic, architectural, and philosophical output of ancient Greece became the normative cultural context upon which the West in general, and Europe in particular, built the myth of Western civilization historical continuity. This European model for the formation of the modern Greek nation state provided all this information about uh, the Western civilization uh, and its continuity and superiority. Having said the above, now I will proceed with the third part of uh, my presentation. Uh, having explained the general uh, framework, I will now turn to gender and sexuality studies. As we saw, while much focus has been given to the appropriation of classical antiquity by racist and nationalist political parties and extremist white supremacist groups, little attention has been paid to liberation movements, in particular to LGBTQ movements and the classical discourses, images, symbols and representation they draw on. In the slogans we saw before, Athena is ours and what united us. When it comes to symbols and representation from classical Greece, there is a straight echo to a we and our mobilized. In banal nationalism, Michael Billings' pivotal insight is the nationhood is not only reproduced by state-centered procedures, aimed at instilling patriotic feelings amongst its members, but also through the routine use of dixies, you, uh, we, them, here, which makes nationhood appear as something natural in people's everyday lives. Specifically, banal nationalism operates with prosaic routine words which take nations for granted and which, in so doing, inhabit them. Small words, rather than grand memorable phrases, offer constant but barely conscious reminders of the homeland, making our national identity unforgettable. Further to LGBTQ movements in the field of sexuality studies, the very same historical locus and topos of classical culture has provided a foundational example for modern homosexual desire. In addition to world famous authors and poets, for instance, Oscar Wilde and the Greek ideal personified by his Dorian Gray, as well as distinguished philosophers, for instance, Michel Foucault and his meticulous examination of Greco-Roman thought in the history of sexuality, several prominent British and American sexuality theorists have celebrated Greek and Roman desire subject for the voicing of dissident sexualities and for offering a pa paradigm for modern homoeroticism. For instance, David Halperin argues that if we are ever to discover who we really are, it will be necessary to examine more closely the many aspects in which Greek sexual practices Differ, differ from our own and do not merely confirm current cherished assumptions about us or legitimate some of our own favorite practices. Similar to the slogan by Athens Pride we saw before, in Halperin's quote, we can see that there is a strange insistence on the first person dictics, for instance, we, our own, us, our around the idea of ancient Greece 
and its male homoerotic sexual practices. In addition to Halperin, when it comes to lesbian historiography, Sappho becomes a prominent figure. For instance, in the book Sappho was a right on women, a liberated view of lesbian names, the lesbian premodern, the Cambridge companion to lesbian literature. Scott Bravman, in his extensive work on transnational LGBT historiography, this lesbian and gay historical imagination, as he called them, draws meticulous attention to the multiple images of the lesbian and gay past and the ways it informs both the present and self-representation of LGBT people on the level of individual, collective and popular memory practices. According to his observation, a primary factor in lesbian and gay cultural, historical and political production is the recurrent thematization of the imagined cultural geography of ancient Greece. Following Martin Bernal's hypothesis on the fabrication of ancient Greece during the 18th and 19th centuries as the origin of European culture, resulting in the penetration of racism and continental chauvinism into all our historiography of philosophy of writing history, Brafman problematizes the integration of this founding myth into lesbian and gay contemporary discourses, representations, and politics. As he further argues, this integration, by impressing white, gay, and lesbian fictions of Greece while leaving racial differences unmarked, unexplored, and thus unrecognized through racial indifference, leads to a figurative construction of a we, leaving all others from whom we distinguish ourselves excluded. In addition to Bravman's observation, though, it seems to me that there is a further implication in the integration of classical antiquity into LGBTQ historiography. Specifically, as we can see, uh, there are uh, occasions that white supremacists and LGBT sites use the same symbols. White supremacist sites incorporate, incorporate images of the Parthenon into their websites with the legend every month is White History Month. The implicit argument is that since white people built this structure, the white race is superior, uh, superior to other races. In terrorist assemblages, among other things, just before, speaks about the three, the three parameters of homonationalism, US sexual exceptionalism, queer as regulatory, and the ascendancy of whiteness. According to Buar, US sexual exceptionalism gestures to narratives of excellence, excellent nationalism, a process whereby a national population comes to believe in its own superiority and its own singularity. At the same time, uh, ideas of excellence involve the segregation and disqualification of racial and sexual others from the national imaginary. Observing these two images together, I cannot but wonder if the ontology of Western sexual exceptionalism hinges upon the idea of classical antiquity and the connection of contemporary sexual identities to classical past. And now I will make, uh, this is the last part of the presentation, I will make a brief, a very brief reference to the archives. Uh, I have gathered the material, but I have not uh, analyzed the material yet because I am still in the process of uh, gathering material. In order to answer the research questions of homoclassicism, I have adopted archival research approaches inspired by Southern epistemological perspectives. Having Southern perspective as my point of departure assists me in bringing to the fore the biases and voices missing from the archives. I examine movements that had have been active at some point in time since the Stonewall riots until today, 
and through their activities, pride parades and documents, magazines, newspapers, etc., they had or have an influential public presence. So, so far, as I said before, I have conducted on-site research at key archives in the UK and the US, and I have collected almost 5,000 pictures. Specifically, the first archive I ever visited, it was Hall Carpenter Archive, housed by the London School of Economics. This archive um, has been housed by the London School of Economics uh, since 1988. In its earliest years, this archive was an entirely community-based and focused organization reliant on volunteers and housed within the community. For financial reasons, it had to be housed by an academic institution. So, in these archives, there are magazines referring to the classical past, for instance, we can see the lesbian magazines Artemis and Sappho. In relation to gay men, most of the material I have found so far referring to the classical past has to do with soft porn magazines. Uh, for instance, here we may see some example of body postures and titles. It is of great interest to me that that one of the most frequent pictures have to do with the disco bolus. We should not forget, though, that Hitler was so much infatuated with this artwork that in 1938 he bought it. Last, another important material I found in this specific archive is exchanges between the UK and other countries. For instance, here we may see an example of exchanges between the UK and uh, South Africa. The next archive I visited was the Bishop's Gate uh, archive, one of the most extensive collection on LGBTQI history, politics and culture in the UK. It covers the late 19th century onward. Um, it has over a uh, 300,000 press cuttings from the straight press regarding history from the 1980s to today. It holds a, it holds a library of around 10,000 titles from academic works, biographies, etc. Uh, here is some of the material that I have collected. Uh, quite recently, I was uh, in Los Angeles at the One Archives at the University of Southern California. Uh, one is the largest repository of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer materials in the world. Founded in 1952, One Archives houses millions of archival items, including books, films, videos, etc. Uh, here is some of the material that I found in this archive. Uh, last, uh, I visited the June major lesbian archives in West Hollywood. This archive is a grassroots archive dedicating to collecting, protecting, and conserving lesbian and feminist women's history. Uh, the archive was founded in 1981. Uh, some of the material I have uh, found has to do uh, mostly with feminist and lesbian material. My next visit is going to be in New York City, where I will visit the LGBT Community Center, the Lesbian Hair Story Archive, and the New York Public Library. Taken together, the archives that I will examine represent a cross-section of different contexts, university-based institutional archives, professional historical archives, and grassroots archives. So uh, this is uh, the project. This is my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thank you so much, Angelica, for this wonderful presentation. And yes, now, uh, please, Paul, oh. the floor is yours. Thank you so much. So first of all, thank you, Angeliki, for the invitation to hear your presentation and to provide 
comments. I find your work extremely rich with empirics, theoretical concepts, questions, and also politically extremely important. Um, I also want to thank Julia and I thank also for organizing this and I thank you, Eleni, I see that you're here for putting us in touch. Um, so anyway, uh, Angelica, your presentation began with three questions and an appeal that we engage with them. So I'm first going to just offer a few comments on the three parts of your presentation and then directly address your, your original questions. Um, since your project is beautifully constructed with a lot of sensitivity to historical contextuality, it seems theoretically and methodologically productive to separate uh, the Greek, UK, and US situation in a first moment before bringing them together. And of course, not in comparison, which would set a standard and that could erase relevant contextual elements, but instead side by side. Um, it's important that Greece has a long history of being imagined as the cradle of Western civilization, but also that the UK colonized much of the globe and outlawed homosexuality in more than 50 countries that its current population includes a heterogeneous critical mass of post-colonial subjects, including queer subjects, and that the US is a self-unavowed settler colony built on genocide, land theft, slavery, labor exploitation, uh, heterogeneous immigrations, and from early on in a binary uh, gender and heteronormativity impositions. So one thing right-wing and dominant LGBT movements in the three sites probably have in common is what um, I also saw in my work on Hindu nationalism and sexuality, which is uh, that there's a process of selectivity of symbolic elements that construct uh, their discourses and practices. So, but methodologically, I think it's very important to understand how selectivity unfolds differently in disparate contexts. Um, in the second section of your talk, you engage with how classical antiquity is appropriated by the right in the global north to white supremacist ends, and you invoke Trump's words. And I'm wondering, I, you know, it really brought to mind that um, it might be helpful to also think with the far right so-called intellectual group called Grèce in France, which actually weaves its entire discourse around the idea that ancient Greece is white Europe's uh, uh, civilizational origin. So you also point out that there are occasions when white supremacists and LGBT websites use the same symbols like the Parthenon. And I'd also wanted to mention that similarly, Archie Gay, the Italian mainstream dominant LGBT organization constructs LGBT continuity with the culture of ancient Rome. And in sum, I just want to point out, you know, I think that your study has very broad implications globally because this is a, a, a global phenomena happening. Um, now I'd like to just turn to the three initial questions in your presentation. And the first, of course, about the, the today's context and the rise of the extreme right in the global north and a critique of mainstream uh, LGBT movements, if, it, if it's still relevant? And if so, what would be the, its terms? The second question about what kind of theoretical approach could preclude co-optation by the right? I think this is a very important question. Um, and the third question, of course, refers to part three. I would like to comment on the first two questions together. First, it may be useful to recognize the rise of the right as a global phenomenon, including the global south. I'm sitting here right now uh, in Salvador Bahia, Brazil, where the ideology of Bolsonaro remains strong, even if he's no longer holding state power. And I also want to invoke India, uh, which I've been studying for decades, where the Hindu right has held state power since 2014. So the way the right considers queer sexualities and the place of history differs in the Brazilian and Indian context already. In Brazil, Bolsonaro's discourse is overtly queer phobic. It selectively draws from earlier colonial and racist discourse and newer right wing evangelist discourse to construct indigenous and black Brazilians with sexuality out of control in different ways. 
And Brazil's dominant ideology of racial mixing is actually about the whitening of Brazilian society. So for Bolsonaro, this means epistem epistemically and physically transforming and eliminating indigenous and black people to produce proper a proper citizen body, which is also a citizen body that's properly proportionate, uh, has properly proportionate heteronormative sexuality. Um, in India, the Hindu right is attempting to create properly uh, Sanskritized Hindu citizen subjects. Its selectivity and position on queers have shifted historically. And I mention this because in your context, you might find such, such shifts, you know, that earlier Hindu nationalism reproduced the British colonial imposition of binary gender and its ideal of militarized masculinity. But today, it faces uh, global Northern homonationalism and it wants to be part of the global North and it has a need not to alienate the Indian vote bank, which has very dis different views on queers. So as a result, there is no longer an official Hindu nationalist stance on queers. They left it open from like 1980s. Some Indian queer intellectuals have actually sought to repair the violence of colonial rupture and queer repression by uncovering Indian queer historical continuities, including in ancient Hindu texts and classic temple art. So I'm thinking of the book by Giti Tadani, uh, Lesbian Desire in Ancient and Modern India, which you know is kind of one of these, it really invokes for me what your, your project is, is trying to think about and, and critique. But the difference here is that you know, in India, there has been a colonial rupture. So it's a, so it's not exactly the same thing. And the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we need to look at, at these things differently from one context to the other, since you're also looking at three contexts. And earlier, the Hindu right, uh, you know, basically denigrated Indian subjects outside the gender binary. But today, the government has adopted, quote, third gender, un, end quote, as an official juridical category that's recognized on identity papers, including passports. And while this may look from the outside like a big trans friendly move of trans recognition, in fact, it's a reductive action because there are so many different kinds of non-binary uh, relationalities and identities in India, and they're now all collapsed under the rubric of third gender, a category that's intelligible to the global North but it doesn't always correspond to reality in, in India. And as some scholars have pointed out, for example, in the Indian state of Tamil Nadu alone, there are 25 different kinds of gender identifications. Anyway, all of this to say that the, the importance of history and context. Um, it seems to me also extremely relevant today to critique dominant LGBT movements transnationally. I mean, you pose that as a question, I think you're already doing it. And I, I really appreciate your project um, going in that direction. And there are multiple reasons for this. I mean, first, I think dominant LGBT movements do immense harm to the most subalternized queers in each context. They leave in place where they reinforce sometimes sordid conditions that can include social death and physical premature death. They sometimes promote what Jin Haritawarn and all call murderous inclusion or forms of belonging that depend on negating oneself to achieve, in, in this case, violent whitening. Dominant LGBT movements also enact what elsewhere, uh, you know, we can call murderous exclusion or modes of exiling the most subalternized queers from society and sometimes from the category human itself. A second reason is because dominant LGBT movements often become a direct path to recruiting LGBT people to the right. In the US, the LGBT right-wing group, Log Cabin Republicans, calls upon queers to vote for Trump. In France, the National Front has high profile white gay male spokesperson. They accuse uh, Muslims of exceptional queer phobia and in that way, they provoke and legitimize juridical and economic inequality and Islamophobic assaults. Um, in India, an early, early out gay man, Ashok Rao Kavi, is, who is a staunch Hindu nationalist, also blames Muslims for Hindu homophobia. So you mentioned that you draw upon Southern theorizations for your project, and I feel that that's completely 
appropriate. Um, and I'm and I look forward to seeing where you will go with that. I know this is a work in progress, and so this is, a, but it's a, that direction seems fruitful to me. And um, across the globe, there are, of course, multiple kinds of critical theorizations under that rubric that could help with your research questions. Many of them emerge from situated subalterneity, queer subalterneity. There's post-colonial theory, um, um, decolonial theory, epistemologies of the global south, subaltern studies. And for the South and the North, of course, in the UK, we have you know Black critical and queer theory. In the US and Canada, Indigenous queer theory, queer of color theory. And in the Decolonizing Sexualities Network that I've had the honor and, and, and privilege and fun to be a part of for many years, um, we've been producing together in dialogue decolonial queer theory. Anyway, wherever you draw from, it seems that for your three research terrains, it's indeed very useful to engage with theories that are expressly decolonial and anti-imperialist that combat epistemicide. These are threads that I find in your work already. So I'm just kind of like teasing a few things out that open a space for contextual queer multiplicities and that consider myriad relations of power like race, ethnicity, class, caste, religion, gender, sexuality, inseparably, whether through concepts such as intersectionality from Kimberly Crenshaw or assemblages from Jasbir Poor, whom you've already cited on homonationalism, concepts substantialité as theorized by Daniel Kergot in France, or co-formations and co-productions, which I have found to be most salient in my work. Um, because of a common foundation of of homo uh, classicism in your terrains, you might also think with Foucault's dispositif, uh, notion of dis dispositif in each context. Um, these kinds of things can help us really. And I, you know, I, I, I can tell you that they helped me, for example, to think about what's happening with LGBT movements and the right in the US and France, specifically through what I then called colonialism and racism, amnesia. Um, which is either intended or uh, it just happens uh, through the repro through reproduction. Um, but in the Indian context, I want to point out that colonialism is remembered very differently. And that um, so it required other kinds of theorizations. Anyway, these are possible theoretical threads that your work may open up, push further, take elsewhere, or bypass altogether. Again, the last question that you pose and also your third, you know, the third part of what you're doing, um, just a few words about that because so I don't take up too much more time. But um, I think, you know, your your archive is amazing. That 5,000 <laughs> pictures is really immense and it, it's fabulous that you were able to do that. I'm just, I'm very impressed by the empirics of that. And I think that because history and contextuality are so vital to your work, uh, and rightly so, that it might be fruitful just to group these images first by, you know, by their context and um, and then by their date and within each country and date by by thematics. And I always, for that kind of work, I always think about, you know, when that thematics that come out of an archive, um, the very classical old work of Klaus Tewelite, you know, male fantasies. And um, because of Tewolite arranges these dreams of the, the pre-fascist German Freikorpsmen into themes that emerge directly out of the archive. And there's been quite a bit of uh, engagement with that in France. I think there's been less engagement with it elsewhere. Um, he was working, of course, with a much more restricted archive than you are. Your archive is amazing, uh, brilliant archive. Uh, but his organizing principle seems to me to be relevant. So I just wanted to thank you again for the opportunity to engage with your really very thoughtful work in progress. I think it's extremely important uh, intellectually and politically, and I look forward to more conversations and more collaborations with you. Thank you.